Today on Blue 58, Xavier McKinney solved the Packers' biggest defensive need, but they probably need to give him a running mate. So let's find him one and throw in another slot defender if we can. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, and I'm happy to be back with you after a little bit of an unexpected absence last week. Nothing major, just sometimes life finds a way to get in your way. Got to adapt Jurassic Park there a little bit. Anyway, the plan from here is to continue through the positions that we've got left. We're probably going to do three positions yet this week, hopefully. So two more, two more episodes, including this one. Then two episodes next week. And then the idea, the plan was to do, um, well, we're going to go right up to the draft. We're going to stick an episode for your questions in there. So if you've got stuff that you want to ask about the draft, if there's specific players that you're wondering about, If there's people that we haven't talked about that you want more information on, start dropping me messages and and whatever now so we can make sure that we've got all of that compiled and together so we can do a big, giant mailbag issue uh, ahead of, or not issue, a podcast ahead of uh, draft day. I'm excited. It, we're getting down to it. It's still only the night, so we got a ways to go, but it, it's getting closer. Safeties are where we're at today, though, and the initial plan was actually to do slots alone, but the testing stuff for guys has just made it super hard this year. We don't have reliable testing numbers on a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys who who haven't done agility drills, which is, I think, a big problem because, as as you remember, if we if you remember the quote that we dropped all you know at the start of our stuff here, you just got to ask Ben Wyatt what it all comes down to. It's about the cones. It, it's about the cones. You got to run the agility drills, and I understand why guys don't. Of of the stuff that guys are doing at the combine and their pro days, that is is probably the hardest drill. Like if you're fast, you, you're going to do a fine in the forty yard dash. If you're a good athlete, you're probably going to do at least okay in the jumping drills. But the agility ones, in addition to needing physical skill to do it, it is it's as, or physical ability to do it. I think it's also a learned skill. It's something that you have to practice. If you've never tried to do one of these drills, you should just to see how, for one thing, physically demanding it is. If you, if you are not a a practicing athlete right now, if you're like a former high school or maybe college level athlete, nothing is going to make you feel more washed than running a three cone drill. It just it humbles you in a big way. But it, it's something that's a learned skill. So you, you understand why maybe guys would not want to put a ton of time and effort into it when they can just train the stuff that's going to make them look really good, like running fast or jumping high. And it's easier to train those things. And of course, you can get better at things like the vertical and the broad jump and stuff like that. But it, it doesn't take the same level of, of practice, I think, that the agility stuff does. So that that's all to say that that has limited the size of our sample here. And um, so we don't have just a slot-specific episode. We're going to combine them with safeties, and we also have a special cameo in here as well that we need to talk about. But all that to say, every year it seems like more guys are standing on their tape and just testing really falls kind of by the wayside. They do it super strategically. And I think, just to put a pin in that, if it works good for them, if if you think you can get by with that as a prospect, you absolutely should. Um, because chances are the, the bad test is going to take you further down the board than a good test is going to push you up unless you're really, really good. I don't really have any gripe with guys not testing other than that it just makes things harder on my end to evaluate the way that we do. But just break out the tiniest violin for me. One podcaster has a harder job. So be it. Looking at the the overall safety and slot group, My numbers are not exact here anymore because I've added one more guy in. We'll talk about him here in a second. But 10 guys cracked seven or more on relative athletic score. So out of the top 250, we had only 10 guys that were either a slot or a safety who broke seven in relative athletic score. That's a pretty small group. And six of those guys met at least some of our thresholds. You throw in Tyke Smith, who didn't break eight in, in relative athletic score, but was otherwise solid. And I think you've got an interesting group of prospects. It's not a big group, but the guys who did meet the athleticism numbers are, are very interesting. And I think there's going to be other guys that are close or maybe just didn't test who are still solid out there too. So if you, you think the Packers still need a safety like I do, I think you're heading into the draft feeling pretty good. Pretty good. This is also a diverse group of prospects. You've got some slots that are real solid. You've got deer deep safeties. 
You've got your box safeties, and they're not really concentrated in any way in one spot in the draft. You've got prospects available at the top. You've got stuff through the middle rounds. You've got late round options. There's even some solid undrafted free agent types that I think would be really interesting here. Um, not in our sample, but just in the in the larger group as a whole. It's it's a good group of safety. So if you think the Packers should add more talent, I think they should. They should come out of draft weekend either with somebody in the draft itself or an undrafted free agent who can make an impact from this class. Methodology-wise, uh, again, just like with the other defensive backs, uh, the cornerbacks, everybody needs to have at least an eight uh, relative athletic score to get into the discussion here, just to keep it in, in one respect to a manageable number, and also because it's a super athleticism-dependent position. We lower the threshold for ball hawks at safety just because looking at the data over a few years now, it seems like uh, safety is kind of counterintuitively, you know, with your reputation as like the ball hawking safety. Uh, they just don't tend to make as many plays on the ball at the college level, so we've we've lowered the threshold a little bit to 20. Still want that 70-plus coverage grade, so your Tier 1 guys are going to be 8-plus relative athletic score, 70-plus coverage grade from Pro Football Focus in their final season, and then 20 or more ball hawks. Tier 2 is just the coverage grade. Tier 3, just the ball hawks. I also want to include some breakdowns in terms of where guys played because that is an important part of the evaluation here for what the Packers in particular need at safety. They have talked about Xavier McKinney, and he has talked about himself as being a versatile prospect, something that someone who can move to different parts of the field and do all sorts of different things. I think that is true, but if you're looking for somebody to compliment him, you would do well to keep in mind what sort of things that they do well as well. So Pro Football Focus has four buckets for defensive back snaps. You can play in the box, you can play in the slot, you can play wide corner, or you can play free safety will tell you, or I will tell you, where these guys broke down their time on the field in their final college season. Again, figuring that that's them at the peak of their powers. So that's where we're going to to talk about them. That is their ideal use case. So uh, they may be able to do other things. We'll try to add in that context if it's relevant elsewhere. Uh, but that is what I've got for you. So the players. Number one, first out of the gate, is, was 22 on the big board at the time we, we captured our, our data here, and he's Cooper DeGene out of Iowa. Six on or just under, six, six foot and like four eighths or something like that. So six foot and a half inch, 204 pounds at his pro day. Solid athlete. Uh, 674 snaps last season. 630 of them came as a wide corner and negligible amounts from there. Last year he played a little bit more in the slot, but he's really kind of just a two-year pl player at Iowa, as tends to be um, the trend there. They don't play their young guys quite as much as some other programs do. We saw that with Lucas Van Ness last year. We had to kind of tease out some of his his playing time and stuff like that and what that meant. Did it matter that he wasn't a starter? No, it didn't. Uh, much the same with Cooper DeGene here. Uh, he had a 76.1 coverage grade, or 76.7 coverage grade, and 20 ball hawks during his two seasons of significant playing time at Iowa, which makes him a Tier 1 prospect for us. But what is he? I'm kind of putting the good and the bad together for Cooper DeGene. Not that there's a lot of bad, but everybody talks about him as basically this spotless prospect, guy who's just squeaky clean in, in every aspect of his game, game almost suspiciously clean. Uh, if you can, you know, play conspiracy theory here a, a little bit. Um, the only real bad thing here I've heard about him is that he may be a little bit stiff flipping his hips at times. Um, but up there with Quinian Mitchell out of Toledo, of the defensive backs we've looked at, he might be the cleanest prospect that I've seen. And it feels like you're really nitpicking if you're trying to find negative stuff in his game. This is just a personal one. But if we're talking bad stuff, if we're talking negatives in the scouting report... I'm suspicious of the you can play him everywhere or anywhere guy, and he's going to be really good. In their scouting report of him, and I don't have the exact quote here, but Pro Football Focus even goes to go so far as to say you can play him anywhere, and he's probably an all-pro talent. That is a lot for me to absorb. It could be true, but I think we have to keep in mind that as good of a prospect as he may be, we're looking for football players not unicorns. It, he, it's true. He may be a unicorn. He may be a free safety. He may be a box safety. He may be a, a wide corner. He may be a slot guy, and he may be an all-pro caliber player at all of those spots. 
what are the odds that he's really an all pro caliber player at all of those spots? Because the, the odds of any given player in the draft being an all pro is pretty low, honestly. That is a pretty high bar. One of the best at his position in the entire league. I struggle with that characterization a little bit, and I know I'm I'm making a lot just of one one scouting report here. But I think you may be setting yourself up for a little bit of disappointment if you're thinking about a guy like Cooper DeGene or any prospect as this, well, plug-and-play-anywhere sort of guy. He can do anything. He can be anything. Whatever we need him to be, he can do. Perhaps that's true. It's probably just a, a little over-aggressive for my taste to characterize any player that way. This is not a DeGene specific thing. I think he looks like a really clean prospect, though. The athleticism's good. He seems to have come back strong from his leg injury late in the season at Iowa there. Uh, he's only been running, I think, since like the last two or three weeks, based on what I've read. And he's, he's coming out at his pro day and plays in a 4-4-3. Not too shabby. Uh, seems like a pretty good athlete. With the ball skills that he has, I would think probably closer to the line of scrimmage, do some slot stuff. I know the Micah Hyde comparison's a little bit tired at this point. A lot of people want to throw that out there. It kind of fits. To my eyes, it looks like the sort of thing that he could do well. Maybe that's something the Packers want to do. And then you've got two versatile safeties. He probably could do the deep stuff if you need him to. Then you've got interchangeability there with Xavier McKinney. You can mix and match depending on the week, depending on who's who's the strongest out there. But uh, it seems like he's a really solid prospect and could do a lot of really interesting things. Uh, just want to, I guess, set expectations a little bit there for someone who's getting some really high praise in the draft to this point. Fun fact about Dejean, has the same birthday as Jair Alexander, both born on February 9th. Uh, Alexander was born in 1997 and Dejean in 2003. Next up is number 58 on the big board, Mike Sainerstrill out of Michigan. Difficult last name to pronounce, and I probably said it incorrectly. But Mike here is 5'9", 182 pounds. Breakdown of his his snaps, primarily a slot. 61% of his snaps last season were in the slot. Another 20, 20, 22% were wide. Then 15% as a box player. That's usually just somebody who moves over slightly as a, as a slot then six snaps as a deep safety. He plays a lot around the line of scrimmage. 85 coverage gave, 25 ball hawks, breaks down pretty diversely in that group. The good stuff here is that he profiles well at just about anything you'd ask of him. According to Pro Football Focus's numbers, he, he plays better in zone than in man. That tracks, I think, generally with what feels intuitive for me with the slot, and I think what we we generally know to be true about the slot uh, because guarding the slot as a zone player seems to be a little bit easier than man because you're guarding an area rather than a guy who can go literally anywhere. A guy who's an elite man cover guy out of the slot is is a rare one indeed. We actually have someone uh, that profiles that way here in this class, but we'll talk about him a little bit later on. Uh, but Sainer Strill seems like that sort of player. He's solid as a zone corner, uh, seems to tackle relatively well uh, for his size, but the size really is the knock on him. Small slot guys can be schematic liabilities in the run game. That's not really my opinion. It's just a function of how football really works because teams can target them and then they become a big problem for your defense. You've got a guy close to the line of scrimmage near the formation who you can just run over in the ground game. I think that was the the big problem for what was it? Uh, Number 22 out of Appalachian State. Uh, Packers drafted him. Yell it if you know it. Um, I will hear you somewhere in the universe and we'll think of it together. Uh, But he he could get on the field for the Packers the last couple of years and then he was released just because they didn't have any use for him. Uh, He was just a little bit too small and was a liability in the ground game. Couldn't get him on the field as good of a cover guy as he was, however good of a cover guy he may have been. Um, And and that just is the way it goes sometimes. You just are too small to play a big man's game and football is a game for big guys. That's just how it works. Fun fact here, Mike Sanders still started his career as a wide receiver. Uh, Three years of wide receiver stuff for him. 37 catches, 539 yards, and five touchdowns. You're looking for ball skill stuff. That's where it is. Next up is Javon Bullard out of Georgia. 74 on the big board at the time of our capture. 5'10", 198 pounds. 61% of his snaps came as a free safety. Another 24% in the slot, and then the rest of the 14% split down primarily in the box. uh, 1% as a wide guy. He's your deep safety. 
probably the best in this class as a deep safety, just from the guys we've got numbers on for sure. 88.4 coverage grade, 15 and a half ball hawks in his career. That makes him a tier two prospect uh, because just not many plays on the ball. He profiles based on those numbers as, as close to a pure coverage guy as you could really imagine seeing in our sample. Uh, the stats say he stays deep, he covers guys, and occasionally drops into the slot. And he covers guys well enough because he, that people are not throwing at him. He doesn't make a ton of plays on the ball because he's playing deep and sound. And that's not necessarily a knock against him. That just means he's doing a good job at his job. Nevertheless, those are the thresholds we've set. And we'll, we'll just stick to it for that with the, the caveats in there. The bad stuff on Bullard, I think, is a little bit nitpicky, too. He's kind of borderline at athleticism-wise in a couple of areas. He had some poor explosiveness numbers. His, his vertical and broad jump were not as good as you necessarily would have hoped. His short shuttle is really good. His three-cone is not as good. His run defense grades are also not super encouraging. We also we just watched Darnell Savage be not great in run defense for several years. Do you really want to add another guy who's kind of middling as a run defender in there and not overly big to boot? I wouldn't have a problem, certainly, if the Packers drafted Bullard. I think it's just those are the knocks on him that exist. Fun fact about Bullard, he was a recipient of the William P. Bruckner Scholarship at Georgia. Who was William P. Bruckner? Sometimes I, I see... Uh, named scholarships, and i got to know who that was. Bruckner was a lifelong Georgia Bulldogs fan. He served in the U.S. Army during World War II and the Korean conflict and retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserve. He was a career salesman working in the pharmaceutical, silver, and diamond industries in Charlotte and Atlanta, and he often said that he had the greatest job in the world because it allowed him to the opportunity to meet new people every day and develop so many lasting friendships. That from his obituary. He died, I believe, in 2003. I think I would have fun selling silver and diamonds as well, but that's just me. 81 on the big board is our next prospect. It's Cole Bishop out of Utah. 6'2", 206 pounds, 45% of his time last season as a free safety, 27% in the box, 17% in the slot, just 4% as a wide corner here. Tier 3 guy, elite athlete, great size, poor coverage grade, but a lot of plays on the ball. Did not crack 70 in coverage grade, so just ball hawks there. I do not have his ball hawks number in my notes I got it in my big spreadsheet, but not in the notes today. Uh, Good stuff for him is if you were drawing up a box safety archetype, I think he would have a lot of the traits that you're looking for. His size is good. His athleticism is good. uh, Solid enough in the run game. Makes a lot of plays on the ball. That says box safety to me. The coverage grade, though, is real bad. The worst uh, among people we have in our sample. To be fair, his coverage grade was really good, the season prior. So 2023, not good enough. 2022, more than respectable at 74.2, good enough to grade, uh, to make our grade. But his coverage grade the year prior to that was even worse, down even in the 40s. So of the three seasons he's got on record, two of them are pretty bad. Proceed with caution if you're expecting good coverage, I think, out of Cole, Bill- Cole Bullard. Fun fact about him, did not carry the ball a lot in high school, but averaged 29 yards per carry when he did. 145 yards on five carries as a senior, including one touchdown. Not too shabby. 113 on the big board is up next in our sample. Dadrian Taylor Demerson out of Texas Tech. 5'10", 197 pounds, almost a clone of Javon Bullard physically. Bullard is 5'10 and a half and 198 pounds. And Taylor Demerson is 5'10 and 3 eighths and 197 pounds. So an eighth of an inch shorter and one pound lighter. If you are one of our international listeners and you would prefer centimeters, it's not very much. Um, I'm not going to convert it over. They're almost exactly the same height there. It's real, real close. Snap breakdown for Taylor Demerson, 60% as a free safety, 25% as a a slot guy, 14% in the box, and another four as a wide corner. Four snaps, not 4%. A very similar snap breakdown to Bullard as well. Kind of, I would say, like the poor man's Bullard. If you can't get Javon Bullard, maybe Dadrian Taylor Demerson is the guy for you, at least according to our numbers here. Tier 2 guy, our coverage grade at 76.2, ball hawks at 24. So I guess technically a Tier 1 guy. I think I had the Tier 2 in there because I was thinking of cornerback numbers there. Uh, If we're continuing the comp to Javon Bullard, he is significantly worse in his coverage grade. Bullard's up in the the mid to high 80s. Uh, Taylor Demerson down in in the mid-70s, but does make more plays on the ball. 
if you are looking for the classic smallish kind of rangy safety, I think this is your guy. Consistent grades year to year, consistent usage year for year. He's a solid profile for a prospect. The bad stuff that jump out about him, uh, his missed tackles in the run game do jump out a 10% missed tackle rate. We have seen a lot worse than that. Darnell Savage lived around the 17 to 18% rate the last couple of years. Double digits is never going to be ideal. That's why I mention it. But that is the thing that really jumps out. It's not a deal breaker. There are guys in this sample that are worse than that. But 10% is, is just not ideal. Fun fact about uh, Dadrian Taylor Demerson got two offers from service academies. A- Army, Air Force, and Utah State were his three offers, according to his Utah State bio. Uh, he got uh, those, he obviously went with Utah or with uh, Texas Tech, um, but uh, two service academies among the, the schools that he turned down. Next up is a guy who should have some interest for you as a Packers fan, because he's already visited with the Packers, Katan Oladapo out of Oregon State, six foot two, two hundred and sixteen pounds. If you're looking for the the box safety, this is the guy in our sample. Thirty eight percent in the box, thirty six percent in the slot. Among the guys that are safeties and not corners, nobody in the the sample of guys that we looked at played anywhere close to as as much at the line of scrimmage as Oladapo did. Another 22% as a deep safety and 2% as a wide corner his final year at Oregon State. Finished his career with a a final season coverage grade of 84. Very, very good. Uh, 34 and a half ball hawks, most among safeties in our samples. Also very, very good. He's the playmaker near the line of scrimmage. That is, you can't fake those numbers in terms of plays on the ball. He's solid in coverage. And he also has the highest run defense we've, of grade we've seen. According to Pro Football Focus, his draft guide had a 91.3 run defense grade. Very, very solid there. Interestingly, and perhaps if you're looking for a knock at him, his missed tackle rate is even higher than Dajun Taylor Demerson, above 12%. So with that run defense comes some missed tackles. I, I'm not super worried about missed tackles, the rate stuff. Uh, and I just mentioned it because with some of these guys, it's really the only negative in their scouting profile. The rate stuff does look bad, but when you break it down, you're talking about maybe one or two missed tackles is the difference between 10% and 17 or 18% over the course of the season. If a guy is doing solid a solid job in coverage and you know knocks away a couple passes and intercepts a couple more, that I think more than makes up for a couple of missed tackles. Of course, it's important. You would, you would prefer zero missed tackles if you could. I just don't want to make it seem like it's a bigger knock on a guy than it is. It's just, in some cases, the only negative thing that really stands out. Fun thing, or fun fact about Oladapo, he chose Oregon State, according to his official school bio, because of, quote, the engineering program and the community, end quote. He actually didn't end up majoring in engineering, majored in design and innovation management. I was curious what that was, so I looked it up in their official course catalog. And they say their design and information management degree focuses on the intersection of design and business, bringing together analytic and creative problem-solving skills through human-centered design lens, through a human-centered design lens. So if you're out there thinking of where you might like go to college, like to go to college, consider Oregon State's design and innovation management program. Katan Oladapo can tell you all about it after the Packers draft him. Let's finish out here with our big prospects with Jerry and Jones, number 151 on the consensus mock draft big board. At the time we looked it up, about a month ago now, so he's probably moved up or down or who knows where by this point. But that's where he was when we looked him up, so that's where we'll talk about him. He uh, played his college ball at Florida State, 5'11", 190 pounds. His snap breakdown, primarily a slot guy, 87% there, 6% as a wide corner, 5% in the box, and another 1% of his time as a free safety. Another slot guy, finally. A coverage grade of 87, 19 ball hawks, so that makes him a tier two prospect. And does appear to have the coverage grade on lock there. He's kind of the inverse of what we saw from Mike Sanderstrill. Uh, better in zone than in man. Jones, uh, uh, Sanderstrill, that is, was better in zone than in man. Jones is better in man than in zone. So if you're thinking about the Packers, you know, switching to a more man-heavy scheme with Jeff Halfley, Jones may be the guy that you want there. The knock on him is like much like with Mike Sanderstrill. He's not that big. He's bigger than his counterpart there, but still weighs only 190 pounds. You're going to take a, a beating if you're in the slot at 190 pounds. One of the big reasons the Packers don't want Jair Alexander there is because of that reason. Uh, Jones is not any bigger than Jair Alexander is. Fun fact there uh, about Mr. Jones here. He had five interceptions in his high school football career, and three of them he returned for touchdowns. 
not too shabby, making efficient work of your time with your with the ball in your hands there. Also of note, we mentioned him up top, uh, but Tyke Smith of Georgia is number 150 on the big board as of the time of our capture. He missed on athleticism, a 7-4-3 relative athletic score. So below the threshold, not by a lot, but just he is below it. But he hit on everything else, primarily a slot guy, uh, 85.8 coverage grade his final season at Georgia, 27 career ball hawks. Check and check on both of those counts there. Just worth mentioning here, even if he doesn't make it into our thresholds, this pretty solid prospect there. And we know that Brian Gutekunst loves Georgia prospects, so maybe there's another one there uh, in Mr. Smith towards the uh, middle portions of the draft. Um, overall, again, I think the Packers definitely need to add a safety. Uh, you can't go into the season, I think, with just Xavier McKinney and uh, Anthony Johnson and Benny Sapp and just hope for the best from there. They they need help there, and they need more. Uh, they need a, a more realistic prospect as um, as a running mate for McKinney than just uh, hoping for the best beyond that. McKinney's not going to solve all of their problems. They need more skilled bodies in the secondary. In terms of the slot stuff, it looks like the Packers are playing Keisha, are paying Keyshawn Nixon like the sort of guy they want to be in the slot exclusively almost all the time. I understand that. I still think it would be good for the Packers if they tried to add a little bit, of, not even competition there, just maybe some redundancy there. Because outside of Nixon, there's really nobody that they have who is going to, to really contribute in the slot at all. Um they just need somebody else who can do it. If Keyshawn Nixon gets hurt, if you just need him exclusively for punt and kickoff returns, you need somebody else that you can get out there. And uh, he is has got to be the guy exclusively, exclusively right now. Uh, they don't have any other options, so I would love to have another option there. Let's live in a world where, where Keyshawn Nixon is a slot option, not the only guy who can do the job. I am encouraged after going through the corners and slots in this year's draft, I think there's a lot of value through the middle and later rounds here. I think there are guys that can play some really good football at these positions that I think the Packers, with needs really at corner and safety, can come out of draft weekend with some interesting prospects uh, at these positions. And I'm interested to see who they end up end up picking. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I'd appreciate it even more if you'd take a second and share this episode with some uh, with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58. Are you still here? I just remembered who the guy I was thinking of was. It's Shamar John Charles. I can't believe that I forgot his name. That's like my exact wheelhouse is just remembering remembering random guys' names. But it, it occurred to me while I was saying the outro, is Shamar John Charles. And now I can picture him, and I should have remembered him because we talked about him again and again and again because we actually highlighted his uh, Alzheimer's fundraiser a couple of years ago. And then I couldn't remember his name, and it bugged me for the rest of the episode. But then I remembered it now. And now I'm telling you that I remembered it, so you don't have to yell the thing out into the universe. But if you still did while you were listening to that, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing a great job. And I hope you have a really nice day if you stuck it all the way through to the end. Enjoy the bonus.